Chapter One of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Chapter One, Billy Byrne. Billy Byrne was a product of the streets and alleys of Chicago's Great West Side. From Halstead to Roby, and from Grand Avenue to Lake Street, there was scarce a bartender whom Billy knew not by his first name, and in proportion to their number, which was considerably less, he knew the patrolmen and plainclothes men equally as well, but not so pleasantly. His kindergarten education had commenced in an alley back of a feed store. Here a gang of older boys and men were wont to congregate at such times as they had naught else to occupy their time and as the bridewell was the only place in which they ever held a job for more than a day or two they had considerable time to devote to congregating they were pickpockets and second-story men made and in the making and all were muckers ready to insult the first woman who passed or pick a quarrel with any stranger who did not appear too burly by night they plied their real vocations by day they sat in the alley behind the feed store and drank beer from a battered tin pail the question of labor involved in transporting the pail empty to the saloon across the street and returning it full to the alley back of the feed store was solved by the presence of admiring and envious little boys in the neighborhood who hung wide-eyed and thrilled about these heroes of their childish lives billy byrne at six was rushing the can for this noble band and incidentally picking up his knowledge of life and the rudiments of his education he glorified in the fact that he was personally acquainted with eddie welch and that with his own ears he had heard Eddie tell the gang how he had stuck up a guy on West Lake Street within fifty yards of the 28th Precinct Police Station. The kindergarten period lasted until Billy was ten. Then he commenced swiping brass faucets from vacant buildings and selling them to a fence who ran a junk shop on Lincoln Street near Kinsey. From this man he obtained the hint that graduated him to a higher grade, so that at twelve he was robbing freight cars in the yard along Kinsey Street and it was about this same time that he commenced to find pleasure in the feel of his fist against the jaw of a fellow man he had had his boyish scraps with the fellows off and on ever since he could remember but his first real fight came when he was twelve he had had an altercation with an erstwhile pal over the division of returns from some freight car boot the gang was all present and his words quickly gave place to blows as they have a habit of doing in certain sections of the west side the men and boys formed a rough ring about the contestants the battle was a long one. The two were rolling about in the dust of the alley quite as often as they were upon their feet exchanging blows. There was nothing fair, nor decent, nor scientific about their methods. They gouged and bit and tore. They used knees and elbows and feet, and but for the timely presence of a brickbat beneath his fingers at the psychological moment Billy Byrne would have gone down to humiliating defeat. As it was, the other boy went down, and for a week Billy remained hidden by one of the gangs pending the report from the hospital when the word came that the patient would live billy felt an immense load lifted from his shoulders for he dreaded arrest and experience with the law that he had learned from childhood to deride and hate of course there was the loss of prestige that would naturally have accrued to him could he have been pointed out as the guy that croaked sheen but there was always a fly in the ointment and billy only sighed and came out of his temporary retirement the battle started billy to thinking and the result of that mental activity was a determination to learn to handle his myths scientifically. People of the West Side do not have hands. They are equipped by nature with myths and dukes. A few have paws and flippers. He had no opportunity to realize his new dream for several years, but when he was about seventeen, a neighbor's son surprised his little world by suddenly developing from an unknown teamster into a locally famous lightweight. The young man never had been affiliated with the gang, and his instruction was defiled with a record of steady employment so billy had known nothing of the sparring lessons his young neighbor had taken or of the work he had done at the downtown gymnasium of larry hillmore now it happened that while the new lightweight was unknown to the charmed circle of the gang billy knew him fairly well by reason of the proximity of their respective parental backyards and so when the glamour of pugilistic success haloed the young man billy lost no time in basking in the light of reflected glory he saw much of his new hero all the following winter 
he accompanied him to many mills and on one glorious occasion occupied a position in the coming champion's corner when the prize fighter toured billy continued to hang around homeward's place running errands and doing odd jobs the while he picked up pugilistic lore and absorbed the spirit of the game along with the rudiments and finer points of its science almost unconsciously then his ambition changed once he had longed to shine as a gunman now he was determined to become a prize fighter but the old gang still saw much of him and he was a familiar figure among the saloon corners along grand avenue and lake street during this period billy neglected the box cars on kinsey street partially because he felt that he was fitted for more dignified employment and as well for the fact that the railroad company had doubled the number of watchmen in the yards but there were times when he felt the old yearning for excitement and adventure these times were usually coincident with an acute financial depression in billy's change pocket and then he would fare forth in the still watches of the night with a couple of boon companions and rouse a souse or stick up a saloon it was upon an occasion of this nature that an event occurred which was fated later to change the entire course of billy burns life upon the west side the older gangs are jealous of the sanctity of their own territory outsiders do not trespass with impunity from halstead to roby and from lake to grand lay the broad hunting preserve of kelly's gang to which billy had been almost born one might say kelly owned the feed store back of which the gang had loafed for years and though himself a respectable business man his name had been attached to the pack of hoodlums who held forth at his back door as the easiest means of locating and identifying its motley members the police and citizenry of this great territory were the natural enemies and prey of kelly's gang but as the kings of old protected the deer of their great forests from poachers so kelly's gang felt it incumbent upon them to safeguard the lives and property which they considered theirs by divine right it is doubtful that they thought of the matter in just this way but the effect was the same and so it was that as billy byrne wended homeward along in the wee hours of the morning after emptying the cash drawers of old schneider's saloon and locking the weeping schneider in his own ice-box he was deeply grieved and angered to see three rank outsiders from twelfth street beating patrolman stan lasky with his own baton the while they simultaneously strove to kick in his ribs with their heavy boots now lasky was no friend of billy byrne but the officer had been born and raised in the district and was attached to the twenty eighth precinct station on lake street near ashland avenue and so was part and parcel of the natural possession of the gang billy felt that it was entirely ethical to beat up a cop provided you confined your efforts to those of your own district but for a bunch of yaps from south of twelfth street to attempt to pull off any such course work in his bellywick why it was unthinkable a hero and rescuer of lesser experience than billy byrne would have rushed melodramatically into the midst of the fray and in all probability have had his face pushed completely through the back of his head for the guys from twelfth street were not of the rah-rah boy type of hoodlum they were bad men with an uppercase b so billy crept stealthily along in the shadows until he was quite close to them and behind them on the way he had gathered up a cute little granite paving block than which there is nothing in the world harder not even the twelfth street skull he was quite close now to one of the men and he was wielding the officer's club to such excellent disadvantage to the officer then he raised the paving block only to lower it silently and suddenly upon the back of that unsuspecting head and then there was two before the man's companions realized what had happened billy had possessed himself of the fallen club and struck one of them a blinding staggering blow across the eyes then number three pulled his gun and fired point black at billy the bullet tore through the mucker's left shoulder it would have sent a more highly organized and nervously inclined man to the pavement but billy was neither highly organized nor nervously inclined so that about the only immediate effect it had upon him was to make him mad before he had been but peeved peeved at the rank crust that had permitted these cheap skates from south of twelfth street to work his territory thoroughly aroused billy was a wonder from a long line of burly ancestors he had inherited the physique of a prize bull from earliest childhood he had fought always unfairly so that he knew all the tricks of street fighting during the past year there had been added to billy's natural fighting ability and instinct a knowledge of the scientific end of the sport the result was something appalling to the gink from twelfth street before he knew whether his shot had killed billy his gun had been wrenched from his hand and flung across the street 
he was down on the granite with a hand as hard as the paving block scrambling his facial attractions beyond hope of recall by this time patrolman lasky had staggered to his feet and most opportunely at that for the man whom billy had dazed with the club was recovering lasky promptly put him to sleep with the butt of the gun that he had been unable to draw when first attacked then he turned to assist billy but it was not billy who needed assistance it was the gentleman from bohemia with difficulty lasky dragged billy from his prey leave enough of him for the inquest pleaded lasky when the wagon arrived and billy had disappeared but lasky had recognized him and thereafter the two had nodded pleasantly to each other upon occasions as they chanced to meet upon the street two years elapsed before the event transpired which provided a crisis in billy's life during this period his existence had been much the same as before he had collected what was coming to him from careless and less muscular citizens he had helped to stick up the half dozen saloons he had robbed the nightmen in two elevated stations and for a while had been on the payroll of a certain union and done strong-arm work in all parts of the city for twenty-five dollars a week by day he was a general utility man about larry hillmore's boxing academy and time and time again hillmore urged him to quit drinking and live straight for he saw in the young giant the makings of a great heavyweight but billy couldn't leave the booze alone and so the best that he got was an occasional five spot for appearing in preliminary bouts with third or fourth rate heavies and has -beens. but during the three years that he had hung about hillmore's he had acquired an enviable knowledge of the manly art of self-defense on the night that things really began to happen in the life of billy byrne that estimable gentleman was lolling in front of the saloon at the corner of lake and Roby. the dips that congregated nightly there under the protection of the powerful politician who owned the place were commencing to assemble billy knew them all and nodded to them as they passed him he noted surprise in the faces of several as they saw him standing there he wondered what it was all about and determined to ask the next man who evidenced even mute wonderment at his presence what was eating him then billy saw a harness bull strolling toward him from the east it was lasky when lasky saw billy he too opened his eyes in surprise and when he came quite close to the mucker he whispered something to him though he kept his eyes straight ahead as though he had not seen billy at all in deference to the whispered request billy presently strolled around the corner toward walnut street but at the alley back of the saloon he turned suddenly in a hundred yards up the alley he found lasky in the shadow of a telephone pole what in hell you doing here asked the patrolman didn't you know that sheen had peached two nights before old man schneider goaded to desperation by the repeated raids upon his cash drawer had shown fight when he again had been invited to elevate his hands and the hold-up men had shot him through the heart she had been arrested on suspicion billy had not been with sheehan that night as a matter of fact he had never trained with him for since the boyish battle that the two had waged there had always been ill feelings between them but with lasky's words billy knew what had happened sheehan says i done it eh he questioned that's what he says i wasn't within a mile of schneider's last night protested billy the lieutenant thinks different said lasky he'd be only too glad to soak you for you've always been too slick to get nicked before orders is out to get you and if i were you i'd beat it and beat it quick i don't have to tell you why i'm handing this to you but it's all i can do for you now take my advice make yourself scarce though you'll have to go some to make your getaway now every man on the force has your description by this time billy turned without a word and walked east in the alley toward lincoln street lasky returned to Roby street in lincoln street billy walked north to kinsey here he entered the railroad yards an hour later he was bumping out of town towards the west on a fast freight three weeks later he found himself in san francisco he had no money but the methods that had so often replenished his depleted exchequer at home he felt would serve the same purpose here being unfamiliar with san francisco billy did not know where best to work but when by accident he stumbled upon a street where there were many saloons whose patrons were obviously seafaring men billy was distinctly elated what could be better for his purpose than a drunken sailor he entered one of the saloons and stood watching a game of cards for thus he seemed to be occupied as a matter of fact his eyes were constantly upon the alert roving about the room to wherever a man was in the act of paying for a round of drinks with a fat wallet might be located presently one that filled him with longing rewarded his careful watch the man was sitting at a table a short distance from billy two other men were with him 
as he paid the waiter from a well-filled pocket-book he looked up to meet billy's eyes upon him with a drunken smile he beckoned the mucker to join them billy felt that fate was overkind to him and he lost no time in heeding her call a moment later he was sitting at the table with the three sailors and had ordered a drop of red eye the stranger was very lavish in his entertainment he scarcely waited for billy to drain one glass before he ordered another and once after billy had left the table for a moment he found a fresh drink awaiting him when he returned his host had already poured it for him it was this last drink that did the business End of chapter one Chapter Two of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Shanghai. When Billy opened his eyes again, he could not recall for the instant very much of his recent past. At last, he remembered with painful regret the drunken sailor it had been his intention to roll. He felt deeply chagrined that his rightful prey should have escaped him. He couldn't understand how it had happened. This Frisco booze must be something fierce, thought Billy. His head ached frightfully, and he was very sick. So sick that the room in which he lay seemed to be rising and falling in a horrible, realistic manner. Every time it dropped, it brought Billy's stomach near to his mouth. Billy shut his eyes. Still the awful sensation. Billy groaned. He never had been so sick in all his life before, and my, how his poor head did hurt. Finding that it only seemed to make matters worse when he closed his eyes, Billy opened them again. He looked about the room in which he lay. He found it a stuffy hole filled with bunks and tiers three deep around the sides. In the center of the room was a table. Above the table a lamp hung suspended from one of the wooden beams of the ceiling. The lamp arrested Billy's attention. It was swinging back and forth rather violently. This could not be a hallucination. The room might seem to be rising and falling but that lamp could not seem to be swinging around in any such manner if it were not really and truly swinging. He couldn't account for it. Again he shut his eyes for a moment. When he opened them to look again at the lamp, he found it still swung as before. Cautiously he slid from his bunk to the floor. It was with difficulty that he kept his feet. Still, that might be but the effect of the liquor. At last he reached the table to which he clung for support while he extended one hand toward the lamp. There was no longer any doubt. The lamp was beating back and forth like the clapper of a great bell. Where was he? Billy saw the window. He found some little round, glass-covered holes near the low ceiling at one side of the room. It was only at the greatest risk to his life and limb that he managed to crawl at all fours to one of them. As he straightened up and glanced through, he was appalled at the sight that met his eyes. As far as he could see, there was naught but a tumbling waste of water. And then the truth of what had happened broke upon him understanding. "'And I was going to roll that guy,' he muttered in helpless bewilderment. "'I was a-going to roll him. Now look what he done to me!' At that moment a light appeared above as the hatch was raised, and Billy saw the feet and legs of a large man descending the ladder before him. When the newcomer reached the floor and turned to look about, his eyes met Billy's, and Billy saw it was his host of the previous evening. "'Well, my hearty, how goes it?' asked the stranger. "'You pulled it off pretty slick,' said Billy. "'What do you mean?' asked the other with a frown. "'Come off,' said Billy. "'You know what I mean.' "'Look here,' replied the other coldly. "'Don't you forget that I'm mate of this ship, "'and that you want to speak respectful to me "'if you ain't looking for trouble. "'My name's Mr. Ward, "'and when you speak to me you say, sir. "'Understood?' "'Billy scratched his head and blinked his eyes. "'He never before had been spoken to in such fashion, "'at least not since he had put on the avoir du poids of manhood.' His head ached horribly, and he was sick to his stomach, frightfully sick. His mind was more upon his physical suffering than upon what the mate was saying, so that quite a perceptible interval of time elapsed before the true dimensions of the affront to his dignity commenced to percolate into the befogged and pain-racked convolutions of his brain. The mate thought that his bluster had bluffed the new hand. That was what he had come below to accomplish. Experience had taught him that an early lesson in discipline and subordination saved unpleasant encounters in the future. He had also learned that there is no better time to put a bluff of his nature across than when the victim is suffering from the after-effects of whiskey and a drug. Mentality, vitality, and courage are then at their lowest ebb. A brave man often is reduced to the pitiful condition of a yellow dog when nausea sits astride his stomach. 
but the mate was not acquainted with billy byrne of kelly's gang billy's brain was befuddled so that it took some time for an idea to wiggle its way through but his courage was all there and all to the good billy was a mucker a hoodlum a gangster a thug a tough when he fought his methods would have brought a flush of shame to the face of his satanic majesty he had hit oftener from behind than from before he had always taken every advantage of size and weight and numbers that he can call to his assistance he was an insulter of girls and women he was a barroom brawler and a saloon corner loafer he was all that was dirty and mean and contemptible and cowardly in the eyes of a brave man and yet notwithstanding all this billy byrne was no coward he was what he was because of training and environment he knew no other methods no other code whatever the meager ethics of his kind he would have lived up to them to the death he never had squealed on a pal and he never had left a wounded friend to fall into the hands of the enemy the police nor had he ever let a man speak to him as the mate had spoken and get away with it and so while he did not act as quickly as would have been his wont had his brain been clear he did act but the interval of time had led the mate into an erroneous conception of its cause and into a further rash show of authority and had thrown him off guard as well what you need said the mate advancing towards billy is a bash on the beezer it'll help you remember that you ain't nothing but a dirty damn landlubber and when your betters come around you'll but what billy would have done in the presence of his betters remained stillborn in the mate's imagination in the face of what billy really did do to his better as that worthy swung a sudden vicious blow at the mucker's face billy byrne had not been scrapping with third and fourth rate heavies and sparring with real live ones for nothing the mate's fist whistled through empty air the blear-eyed hunk of clay that had seemed such easy prey to him was metamorphosed on the instant into an alert cat-like bundle of steel sinews and billy byrne swung that awful right with the pile-driver weight that even the big smoke himself had acknowledged respect for straight to the short ribs of his antagonist with a screech of surprise and pain the mate crumpled in the far corner of the forecastle rammed halfway beneath the bunk by the force of the terrific blow like a tiger billy byrne was after him and dragging the man out into the center of the floor space he beat and mauled him until his victim's blood-curling shrieks echoed through the ship from stem to stern when the captain followed by a half-dozen seamen rushed down the companionway he found billy sitting astride the prostrate form of the mate his great fingers circled the man's throat and with mighty blows he was dashing the fellow's head against the hard floor another moment and murder would have been complete avast there cried the captain as though to punctuate his remark he swung the heavy stick he usually carried full onto the back of billy's head it was that blow that saved the mate's life for when billy came to he found himself in a dark and smelly hole chained and padlocked to a heavy stanchion they kept billy there for a week but every day the captain visited him in an attempt to show him the error of his way the medium used by the skipper for impressing his ideas of discipline upon billy was a large hard stick at the end of the week it was necessary to carry billy above to keep the rats from devouring him for the continued beatings and starvation had reduced him to little more than an unconscious mass of raw and bleeding meat there remarked the skipper as he viewed his work by the light of day i guess that fellow will know his place next time an officer and a gentleman speaks to him that billy survived is one of the hitherto unrecorded miracles of the power of matter over mind a man of intellect of imagination a being of nerves would have succumbed to the shock alone but billy was not as these he simply lay still and thoughtless except for half-formed ideas of revenge until nature unaided built up what the captain had so ruthlessly torn down ten days after they had brought him up from the hold billy was limping about the deck of the half moon doing light manual labor from the other sailors aboard he learned that he was not the only member of the crew who had been shanghaied aside from a half dozen reckless men from the criminal classes who had signed voluntarily either because they could not get a berth upon a decent ship or desired to flit as quietly from the law zone of the united states as possible not a man was there who had been signed regularly they were as tough and vicious a lot as fate ever had foregathered in one forecastle and with them billy byrne felt perfectly at home his early threats of awful vengeance to be wreaked upon the mate and the skipper had subsided with the rough but sensible advice of his messmates the mate for his part gave no indication of harboring the assault that billy had made upon him other than to assign the most dangerous or disagreeable duties of the ship to the mucker whenever it was possible to do so 
but the result of this was to hasten Billy's nautical education and keep him in excellent physical trim. All traces of alcohol had long since vanished from the young man's system. His face showed the effects of his forced abstemiousness in a marked degree. The red, puffy, blotchy complexion had given way to a clear, tanned skin. Bright eyes supplanted the bleary, bloodshot things that had given the bestial expression to his face in the past. His features, always regular and strong, had taken on a peculiarly refined dignity from the salt air, the clean life, and the dangerous occupation of the deep-sea sailor, that would have put Kelly's gang to a pinch to have recognized their erstwhile crony had he suddenly appeared in their midst in the alley back of the feed store on Grand Avenue. With the new life Billy found himself taking on a new character. He surprised himself singing at his work. He whose whole life up to now had been devoted to dodging honest labor, whose motto had been, The world owes me a living, and it's up to me to collect it. Also, he was surprised to discover that he liked his work, that he took keen pride in striving to outdo the men who worked with him, and this spirit, despite the suspicion which Captain entertained of Billy since the episode of the forecastle, went far to making his life more endurable on board the Half Moon, for workers such as the mucker developed into are not to be sneezed at, and though he had little idea of subordination, it was worth putting up with something to keep him in condition to work. It was this line of reasoning that saved Billy's skull on one or two occasions, when his impudence had been sufficient to have provoked the skipper to a personal assault upon him under ordinary conditions, and Mr. Ward, having tasted of Billy's medicine once, had no craving for another encounter with him that would entail personal conflict. The entire crew was made up of ruffians and unhung murderers, but Skipper Sims had had little experience with seamen of any other ilk, so he handled them roughshod, using his horny fist and the short, heavy stick that he habitually carried, in lieu of argument. But with the exception of Billy, the men all had served before the mast in the past, so that the ship's discipline was to some extent ingrained in them all. Enjoying his work, the life was not an unpleasant one for the mucker. The men of the forecastle were of the kind he had always known. There was no honor among them, no virtue, no kindliness, no decency. With them Billy was at home. He scarcely missed the old gang. He made his friends among them and his enemies. He picked quarrels as had been his way since childhood. His science and his great strength, together with his endless stock of underhand tricks, brought him out of each encounter with fresh laurels. Presently he found it difficult to pick a fight. His messmates had had enough of him. They left him severely alone. These oft-time bloody battles engendered no deep-seated hatred in the hearts of the defeated. They were part of the day's work and play of the half-brutes that Skipper Skims had gathered together. There was only one man aboard whom Billy really hated. That was the passenger, and Billy hated him. Not because of anything that the man had said or done to Billy, for he had never even so much as spoken to the mucker, but because of the fine clothes and superior air which marked him plainly to Billy as one of that loathed element of society, a gentleman. Billy hated everything that was respectable. He had hated the smug, self-satisfied merchants of Grand Avenue. He had writhed in torture at the sight of every shiny, purring automobile that had ever passed him with his load of well-groomed men and women. A clean, stiff collar was to Billy as a red rag to a bull. Cleanliness, success, opulence, decency spelled but one thing to Billy, physical weakness, and he hated physical weakness. His idea of indicating strength and manliness lay in displaying as much of brutality and uncouthness as possible. To assist a woman over a mud hole would have seemed to Billy an acknowledgment of pusillanimity. To stick out his foot and trip her so that she sprawled full length in it, the hallmark of bluff manliness. And so he hated, with all his strength of a strong nature, the immaculate, courteous, well-bred man who paced the deck each day smoking a fragrant cigar after his meals. Inwardly he wondered what the dude was doing on board such a vessel as the Half Moon and marveled that so weak a thing dared venture among real men. Billy's contempt caused him to notice the passenger more than he would have been ready to admit. He saw that the man's face was handsome, but that there was an unpleasant shiftiness to his brown eyes, and then, entirely outside of the former reasons for hating him, Billy came to loathe him intuitively, as one who was not to be trusted. Finally, his dislike for the man became an obsession. He haunted, when discipline permitted, that part of the vessel where he would be most likely to encounter the object of his wrath, hoping, always hoping, that the dude would give him some slight pretext for pushing in his mush, as Billy would have so picturesquely have worded it. 
He was loitering about the deck for this purpose one evening when he overheard part of a low-voiced conversation between the object of his wrath and Skipper Simms, just enough to set him to wondering what he was doing, and to show him that whatever it might be it was crooked and that the immaculate passenger and Skipper Simms were both in on it. He questioned Boney Sawyer and Red Sanders, but neither had nearly as much information as Billy himself, and so the half-moon came to Honolulu and lay at anchor some hundred yards from the staunch, trim, white yacht, and none knew, other than the half-moon's officers and her single passenger, the real mission of the harmless-looking little brigantine. End of chapter 2《Chapter Three of the Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Conspiracy No shore leave was granted the crew of the Half Moon while the vessel lay off Honolulu, and deep and ominous were the grumblings of the men. Only First Officer Ward and the second mate went ashore. Skipper Sims kept the men busy painting and holy stoning as a vent for their pent emotions. Billy Byrne noticed that the passenger had abandoned his daylight strolls on deck. In fact, he never once left his cabin while the half-moon lay at anchor, until darkness had fallen. Then he would come on deck, often standing for an hour at a time with eyes fastened steadily upon the brave little yacht from the canopied upper deck, of which gay laughter and soft music came floating across the still water. When Mr. Ward and the second mate came to shore, the strange thing happened. They entered a third-rate hotel near the waterfront, engaged a room for a week, paid in advance, were in the room for half an hour, and emerged clothed in civilian raiment. Then they hastened to another hostelry, a first-class one this time, and the second mate walked ahead in frock coat and silk hat, while Mr. Ward trailed behind in a neat blue serge sack suit, carrying both bags. At the second hotel, the second mate registered as Henry Terrier, Count de Cadenet, and servant France. His first act thereafter was to hand a note to the clerk, asking that it be dispatched immediately. The note was addressed to Anthony Harding, Esquire, on board Yacht Lotus. Count de Cadenet and his servant repaired immediately to the Count's rooms, there to await an answer to the note. Henry Terrier, the second officer of the Half Moon, in frock coat and silk hat, looked every inch a nobleman and gentleman. What his past had been only he knew but his polished manners, his knowledge of navigation and seamanship, and his leaning toward the ways of the Martinet in his dealing with the man beneath him had led Skipper Simms to assume that he had once held a commission in the French Navy, from which he doubtless had been kicked in disgrace. The man was cold, cruel, of a moody disposition, and quick to anger. He had been signed as second officer for this cruise through the intervention of Divine and Clinker. He had sailed with Simms before, but the skipper had found him too hard a customer to deal with and had been on the point of seeking another second when Divine and Clinker discovered him on board the Half Moon, and after ten minutes' conversation with him, found that he fitted so perfectly into their scheme of action that they would not hear of Sims releasing him. Ward had little use of the Frenchman, whose haughty manner and condescending airs grated on the sensibilities of the uncouth and boorish first officer. The duty which necessitated him acting in the capacity of Terrier's servant was about as distasteful to him as anything could be, and only served to add to his hatred for the inferior, who, in the bottom of his heart, he knew to be in every way, except upon the roster of the half-moon, his superior. But money can work wonders, and Divine's promise that the officers and crew of the half-moon would have a cool million United States dollars to divide among them, in case of the success of the venture, had quite effectually overcome any dislike which Mr. Ward had felt for this particular phase of his duty. The two officers sat in silence in their room at the hotel, awaiting an answer to the note they had dispatched to Anthony Harding, Esquire. The parts they were to act had been carefully rehearsed on board the Half Moon many times. Each was occupied with his own thoughts, and as they had nothing in common outside the present rascality that had brought them together, and as that subject was one not well to discuss more than necessary, there seemed no call for conversation. On board the yacht in the harbor, Preparations were being made to land a small party that contemplated a motor trip to the Nuanu Valley when a small boat drew alongside and a messenger from the hotel handed a sealed note to one of the sailors. From the deck of the Half Moon, Skipper Sims witnessed the transaction, smiling inwardly. Billy Byrne also saw it, but it meant nothing to him. He had been lolling upon the deck of the brigantine, glaring at the yacht Lotus, 
hating her and the gay well-dressed men and women he could see laughing and chatting upon her deck they represented to him the concentrated essence of all that was pusillanimous disgusting loathsome in that other world that was as far separated from him as though he had been a grub worm in the manure pile back of brady's livery stable he saw the note handed by the sailor to a gray-haired smooth-faced man a large sleek well-groomed man billy could imagine the white hands and polished nails of him the thought was nauseating the man who took and opened the note was anthony harding esq he read it and then passed it to a young woman who stood nearby talking with other people here barbara he said is something of more interest to you than to me if you wish i'll call upon him and invite him to dinner tonight the girl was reading the note anthony harding esq on board yacht lotus honolulu dear mr harding this will introduce a very dear friend of mine count de cadenet who expects to be in honolulu about the time that you are there the count is traveling for pleasure and as he is entirely unacquainted upon the islands any courtesies that you may show him will be greatly appreciated cordially l courtright divine the girl smiled as she finished perusing the note larry is always picking up titles and making dear friends of them she laughed i wonder where he found this one or where this one found him suggested mr harding well i suppose that the least we can do is have him aboard for dinner we'll be leaving tomorrow so there won't be much entertaining we can do let's pick him up on our way through town now suggested barbara harding and take him with us for the day that will be settling our debt to friendship and dinner tonight can depend upon what sort of person we find the count to be as you will replied father and so it came about that two big touring cars drew up before the count de cadenet's hotel half an hour later and anthony harding esq entered and sent up his card the count came down in person to greet his caller harding saw at a glance that the man was a gentleman and when he had introduced him to the other members of the party it was evident that they appraised him quite as they had their host barbara harding seemed particularly taken with the count de cadenet insisting that he join those who occupied her car and so it was that the second officer of the half moon rode out of honolulu in pleasant conversation with the object of his visit to the island barbara harding found de cadenet an interesting man there was no corner of the globe however remote with which he was not to some degree familiar he was well read and possessed the ability to discuss what he had read intelligently and entertainingly there was no evidence of moodiness in him now he was the personification of affability for was he not monopolizing the society of a very beautiful and very wealthy young lady the day's outing had two significant results it put into the head of the second mate of the half moon that which would have caused the skipper and the retiring mr divine acute mental perturbation could they have guessed it and it put de cadenet into the possession of information which necessitated his refusing the urgent invitation to dine upon the yacht lotus that evening the information that the party would sail the following morning en route to manila i cannot tell you he said to mr harding how much i regret the circumstance that must rob me of the pleasure of accepting your invitation only absolute necessity i assure you could prevent me from being with you as long as possible and though he spoke to the girl's father he looked directly into the eyes of barbara harding a young woman of less experience might have given some outward indication of the effect of the speech upon her but whether she was pleased or otherwise the count de cadenet could not guess for she merely voiced the smiling regrets that courtesy demanded they left de cadenet at his hotel and as he bid them farewell the man turned to barbara harding with a low aside i shall see you again miss harding he said very very soon she could not guess what was in his mind as he voiced this rather under the circumstances unusual statement could she have the girl would have been terror-stricken but she saw that in his eyes which she could translate and she wondered many times that evening whether she was pleased or angry with the message it conveyed the moment de cadenet entered the hotel he hurried to the room where the impatient mr ward awaited him quick he cried we must bundle out of here post haste they sail tomorrow morning your duties as valet have been light and short-lived but i could give you an excellent recommendation should you desire to take service with another gentleman that'll be about all of it mr terrier snapped the first officer coldly i did not embark upon this theatrical enterprise for amusement i see nothing funny in it and i wish you to remember that i am still your superior officer terrier shrugged ward did not chance to catch the ugly look in his companion's eye together they gathered up their belongings descended to the office 
paid their bill and a few moments later they were changing back to their sea clothes in the little hotel where they first had engaged accommodations half an hour later they stepped to the deck of the half moon billy burns saw them from where he worked in the vicinity of the cabin when they were not looking he scowled maliciously at them they were the personal representatives of authority and billy hated authority in whatever guise it might be visited upon him he hated law and order and discipline i'd like to meet one of them guys on green street some night he thought he saw them enter the captain's cabin with the skipper and then he saw mr divine join them billy noted the haste displayed by the four and it set him to wondering the scrap of conversation between divine and sims that he had overheard returned to him he wanted to hear more and as billy was not handicapped by any overly refined notions of the ethics which frown upon eavesdropping he lost no time in transferring the scene of his labors to a point sufficiently close to one of the cabin ports to permit him to note what took place within what the mucker heard of that conversation made him prick up his ears he saw that something after his own heart was doing something crooked and he wondered that so pusillanimous a thing as divine could have had a hand in it it almost changed his estimate of the passenger of the half moon the meeting broke up so suddenly that billy had to drop to his knees to escape the observation of those within the cabin as it was terrier who had started to leave a second before the others caught a fleeting glimpse of a face that quickly had been withdrawn from the cabin skylight as though its owner were fearful of detection without a word to his companion the frenchman left the cabin but once outside he bounded up the companionway to the deck with the speed of a squirrel nor was he an instant too soon for as he emerged from below he saw the figure of a man disappearing forward hey there you he cried come back here the mucker turned a sulky scowl upon his lowering countenance and the second officer saw that it was the fellow who had given ward such a trimming the first day out oh it's you is it burn he said in a not unpleasant tone come to my quarters a moment i want to speak with you and so saying he wheeled about and retraced his way below the seaman at his heels my man said terrier once the two were behind the closed door of the officer's cabin i needn't ask how much that you overheard of the conversation in the captain's cabin if you hadn't overheard a great deal more than you should you wouldn't have been so keen to escape detection right now what i wanted to say to you is this keep a close tongue in your head and stick by me in what's going to happen in the next few days this bunch he jerked his thumb in the direction of the captain's cabin are fixing their heads for halters and i for one don't intend to poke my head through any noose of another man's making there's more in this thing if it's handled right and handled without too many men in on the whack of than we can get out of it if that man divine has to be counted in i have a plan of my own and it won't take but three or four of us to put it across you don't like ward he continued and you may be almighty sure that mr ward ain't losing any sleepy nights over love for you if you stick to that bunch ward will do you out of your share as sure as you are a foot high and the chances are that he'll do you out of a whole lot more besides as a matter of fact burn you're a mighty poor life insurance risk right now with a life expectancy that's pretty near minus as long as bender ward is on the same ship with you do you understand what i mean oh said billy burn i ain't afraid of that stiff let him make any funny crack at me and i'll cave in a handful of slats for him the piker that's all right too burn said terrier of course you can do it if anyone can provided you get the chance but ward isn't the man to give you any chance there may be shooting necessary within the next day or so and there's nothing to prevent ward letting you have it in the back purely by accident and if he don't do it then there's all kinds of opportunities for it before any of us see the white man's port again he'll get you burn he's that kind now with my proposition you'll be shut of ward skipper sims and divine there'll be more money in it for you and you won't have to go around expecting a bullet in the small of your back every minute what do you say are you game or shall i have to go back to skipper sims and ward and tell them that i caught you eavesdropping oh i'm game said billy byrne if you'll promise me a square deal on the divvy the frenchman extended his hand let's shake on it he said billy took the proffered palm in his that's a go he said but hadn't you better wise me to what's doing not now said terrier someone might overhear just as you did wait a bit until i have a better opportunity and i'll tell you all there is to know in the meantime think over who'd be the best men to let into this with us we'll need three or four more besides ourselves now go on deck about your duties as though nothing had happened and if i'm a bit rougher than usual with you you'll understand that it's to avert any possible suspicion later i'm next said billy byrne End of chapter 3
Chapter Four of The Mucker by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. Piracy. By dusk, the trim little brigantine was scudding away toward the west before a wind that could not have suited her better had it been made to order at the special behest of the devil himself to speed his minions upon their devil's work. All hands were in the best of humor. The crew had forgotten their recent rancor in not having been permitted shore leave at Honolulu in the expectancy of adventure in the near future, for there was that in the atmosphere of the half-moon which proclaimed louder than words the proximity of excitement and the goal toward which they had been sailing since they left San Francisco. Skipper Sims and Divine were elated at the luck which had brought them to Honolulu in the nick of time, and at the success of Terrier's mission at the port. They had figured upon a week at least there before the second officer of the half-moon could ingratiate himself sufficiently into the goodwill of the Hardings to learn their plans. And now they were congratulating themselves upon their acumen in selecting so fit an agent as the Frenchman for the work he had handled so expeditiously and so well. Ward was pleased that he had not been forced to prolong the galling masquerade of valet to his inferior officer. He was hopeful, too, that coming events would bring to the fore an opportunity to satisfy the vengeance he had inwardly sworn against the sailor who had so roughly manhandled him a few weeks past. Terrier had not been in error in his estimate of his fellow officer. Billy Byrne, the arduous labor of making sail over for the time, was devoting his energies to the task of piecing out from what Terrier had told him and what he had overheard outside the skipper's cabin some sort of explanation to the work ahead. As he pondered Terrier's proposition, he saw the wisdom of it. It would give those interested a larger amount of the booty for their share. Another feature of it was that it was underhanded, and that appealed strongly to the mucker. Now, if he could but devise some scheme for double-crossing Terrier, the pleasure and profit of the adventure would be tripled. It was this proposition that was occupying his attention when he caught sight of Bony Sawyer and Red Sanders emerging from the forecastle. Billy Byrne hailed them. When the mucker had explained the possibilities of profit that were to be had by entering the conspiracy aimed at Sims and Ward, the two seamen were enthusiastically for it. Bony Sawyer suggested that the black cook, Blanco, was about the only other member of the crew upon whom they could depend, and at Byrne's request, Bony promised to enlist the cooperation of the giant Ethiopian. From early morning on the second day out of Honolulu, keen eyes scanned the eastern horizon through powerful glasses until about two bells in the afternoon watch a slight smudge became visible about two points north of east immediately the course of the half moon was altered so that she bore almost directly north by west in an effort to come safely into the course of the steamer which was seen rising rapidly above the horizon the new course of the brigantine was held as long as it seemed reasonably safe without danger of being sighted under full sail by the oncoming vessel then her head was brought into the wind, and one by one her sails were lowered and furled, as the keen eyes of the second officer, Terrier, announced that there was no question but that the white hull in the distance was that of the steam-pleasure yacht, Lotus. Upon the deck of the unsuspecting vessel, a merry party laughed and chatted in happy ignorance of the plotters in their path. It was nearly half an hour after the half-moon had come to rest, drifting idly under bare poles, that the lookout upon a Lotus sighted her. Sailing vessel lying to west half south, he shouted, flying distress signals. In an instant, guests and crew had hurried to points of vantage where they might obtain unobstructed view of the stranger and take advantage of this break in the monotony of the long sea voyage. Anthony Harding was on the bridge with the captain, and both men had leveled their glasses upon the distant ship. Can you make her out? asked the owner. She's a brigantine, replied the officer and all that I can make out from here would indicate that everything was shipshape about her. Her canvas is neatly furled, and she is evidently well manned, for I can see a number of figures above deck apparently engaged in watching us. I'll alter our course to speak to her. We'll see what's wrong, and give her a hand if we can. That's right, replied Harding. Do anything you can for them. A moment later he joined his daughter and their guests to report the meager information he had. How exciting, exclaimed Barbara Harding. Of course, it's not a real shipwreck, but maybe it's the next thing to it. The poor souls may have been drifting about here in the center of the Pacific without food or water for goodness knows how many weeks. And now just think how they must be lifting their voices in thanks to God for his infinite mercy in guiding us to them. 
if they had been drifting for any considerable number of weeks without food or water hazarded billy mallory but the only things they'll need'll be what we didn't have the foresight to bring along an undertaker and a preacher don't be hard billy returned miss harding you know perfectly well that i didn't mean weeks i meant days and anyway they'll be grateful to us for what we can do for them i can scarcely wait to hear their song billy mallory was inspecting the stranger through mr harding's glass suddenly he gave an exclamation of dismay by george he cried it is serious after all that ship's a fire look mr harding and he passed the glass over to his host and sure enough as the owner of the lotus found the brigantine again in the centre of his lens he saw a thin column of black smoke rising amidships but what he did not see was mr ward upon the opposite side of the half moon's cabin superintending the burning by the black cook of a bundle of oily rags in an iron boiler by jove exclaimed mr harding this is terrible the poor devils are panic-stricken look at em making for the boats and with that he dashed back to the bridge to confer with his captain yes said that officer i noticed the smoke about the same time you did funny it wasn't apparent before i've already signaled full speed ahead and i've instructed mr foster to have the boats in readiness to lower away if we find that they're short of boats on the brigantine what i can't understand he added after a moment's silence is why they didn't show any signs of excitement about that fire until we came within easy sight of them it looks funny well we'll know in a few minutes more returned mr harding the chances are the fire is just a recent addition to their predicament whatever it may be and that they have only just discovered it themselves then it can't have gained enough headway insisted the captain to cause them any such immediate terror as would be indicated by the haste with which the whole ship's crew is tumbling into those boats but as you say sir we'll have their story out of them in a few minutes now so it's idle speculating beforehand the officers and the men of the half moon in so far as those on board the lotus could guess had all entered the boats at last and were pulling frantically away from their own ship toward the rapidly nearing yacht but what they did not guess and could not know was that mr divine paced nervously to and fro in his cabin while second officer terrier tending the smoking rags that ward and blanco had resigned to him that they might make their places in the boats terrier had been greatly disgusted with the turn events had taken for he had determined upon a line of action that he felt would prove highly remunerative to himself it had been nothing less than a bold resolve to call blanco burn bony and red to his side the moment simms and ward revealed the true purpose of their ruse to those on board the lotus and with his henchmen take sides with the men of the yacht against his former companions as he had explained it to billy byrne the idea was to permit mr harding to believe that terrier and his companions had been duped by skipper simms that they had no idea of the work they were about to be called upon to perform until the last moment and that then they had done the only thing they could to protect the passengers and crew of the lotus and then terrier had concluded when they think we are a band of heroes and the best friends they have on earth we'll just naturally be in a position to grab the whole lot of them and collect ransoms on ten or fifteen instead of just one bully exclaimed the mucker you've got some bean mate as a matter of fact terrier had had no intention of carrying the matter as far as he had intimated to billy except as a last resort he had been mightily smitten by the face and fortune of barbara harding and had seen in the trend of events a possible opportunity of so deeply obligating her father and herself that when he paid court to her she might fall a willing victim to his wiles in this case he would be obliged to risk nothing and could make away with his accomplices by explaining to mr harding that he had been compelled to concoct this other scheme to obtain their assistance against simms and ward then they can throw the three into irons and all would be lovely but now that fool ward had upset the whole thing by hitting upon the asinine fire hoax as an excuse for boarding the lotus in the forest and had further dampened terrier's pet scheme by suggesting to skipper simms the danger of terrier being recognized as they were boarding the lotus and bringing suspicion upon them all immediately they all knew that a pleasure yacht like the lotus was well supplied with small arms and that at the first intimation of danger there would be plenty of men aboard to repel assault and in all probability with entire success that there were excellent grounds for terrier's belief that he could win barbara harding's hand with such a flying start as his daring plan would have assured him may not be questioned for the man was cultivated polished and in a sinister way good-looking the title that he had borne upon the occasion of his visit to the yacht was 
all unknown to his accomplices, his by right of birth, so that there was nothing other than a long dead scandal in the French Navy that might have proved a bar to an affiance such as he dreamed of. And now to be thwarted in the last moment, it was unendurable. That pig of Ward had sealed his own death warrant. Of that, Terrier was convinced. The boats were now quite close to the yacht, which had slowed down almost to a dead stop. In answer to the query of the Lotus's captain, Skipper Sims was explaining their trouble. "'I'm Captain Jones,' he shouted, of the brigantine Clorinda, Frisco to Yokohama, with dynamite. We disabled our rudder yesterday, and this afternoon fire started in the hold. It's making headway fast now, and it'll reach the dynamite most any time. You'd better take us aboard and get away from here as quick as you can. Taint safe nowhere within five hundred fathom of her. You'd better make haste, Captain, hadn't you? suggested Mr. Harding. I don't like the looks of things, sir, replied that officer. She ain't flying any dynamite flag, and if she was and had a hold full, there wouldn't be any particular danger to us, and any one that has ever shipped dynamite would know it, or ought to. It's not fire that detonates dynamite, it's concussion. No, sir, Mr. Harding, there's something queer here. I don't like the looks of it. Why, just take a look at the faces of those men. Did you ever see such an ugly-looking pack of unhung murderers in your life, sir? I must admit that they're not an overly prepossessing crowd, Norris, replied Mr. Harding, but it's not always either fair or safe to judge strangers entirely by appearances. I'm afraid that there's nothing else for it in the name of common humanity than to take them aboard, Norris. I'm sure your fears are entirely groundless. Then it's your orders, sir, to take them aboard? asked Captain Norris. Yes, Captain, I think you'd better, said Mr. Harding. Very good, sir, replied the officer, turning to give the necessary commands. The officers and men of the half-moon swarmed up the sides of the lotus, dark-visaged, fierce, and forbidding. Reminds me of a boarding party of pirates, remarked Billy Mallory, as he watched Blanco, the last to throw a leg over the rail, reach the deck. They're not very pretty, are they? murmured Barbara Harding, instinctively shrinking closer to her companion. Pretty, scarcely describes them, Barbara, said Billy, and do you know that somehow I am having difficulty in imagining them on their knees, giving up thanks to the Lord for their rescue? That was your recent idea of them, you will recall. If you have purposely set yourself the task of being more than ordinarily disagreeable today, Billy, said Barbara sweetly, I'm sure it will please you to know that you are succeeding. I'm glad I'm successful at something, then, laughed the man. I've certainly been unsuccessful enough in another matter. What, for example, asked Barbara innocently. Why, in trying to make myself so agreeable, heretofore, that you'd finally consent to say yes for a change. Now you're going to make it all the worse by being stupid, cried the girl petulantly. Why can't you be nice, as you used to before you got this silly notion into your head? I don't think it's a silly notion to be head over heels in love with the sweetest girl on earth, cried Billy. Hush, someone will hear you. I don't care if they do. I'd like to advertise it to the whole world. I'm proud of the fact that I love you, and you don't care enough about it to realize how really hard I'm hit. Why, I'd die for you, Barbara, and welcome the chance. Why, my God, what's that? Oh, Billy, what are those men doing? cried the girl. They're shooting. They're shooting at Papa. Quick, Billy, do something. For heaven's sake, do something. On the deck below them, the rescued crew of the Clorinda had surrounded Mr. Harding, Captain Norris, and most of the crew of the Lotus, flashing quick-drawn revolvers from beneath shirts and coats, and firing at two of the yacht's men who showed fight. Keep quiet, commanded Skipper Sims, and there won't none of you get hurted. What do you want of us? cried Mr. Harding. If it's money, take what you can find aboard us and go on your way. No one will hinder you. Skipper Sims paid no attention to him. His eyes swept the loft to the upper deck. There he saw a wide-eyed girl and a man looking down upon them. He wondered if she was the one they sought. There were other women aboard. He could see them huddled frightened behind Harding and Norris. Some of them were young and beautiful, but there was something about the girl above him that assured him that she could be none other than Barbara Harding. To discover the truth, Sims resorted to a ruse, for he knew that were he to ask Harding outright if the girl were his daughter, the chances were more than even that the old man would suspect something of the nature of their visit and deny her identity. "'Who is that woman you have on board here?' he cried in an accusing tone of voice. "'That's what we're here to find out.' "'Why, she's my daughter, man,' blurted Harding. "'Who did you?' "'Thanks,' said Skipper Sims, with a self-satisfied grin. "'That's what I wanted to be sure of.' Hey, you, Byrne, you're nearest the companionway. Fetch the girl. At the command, the mucker turned and leapt up the stairway to the upper deck. Billy Mallory had overheard the conversation below and Sims's command to Byrne. 
disengaging himself from barbara harding who in her terror had clutched his arm he ran forward to the head of the stairway the men of the lotus looked on in mute and helpless rage all were covered by the guns of the boarding party the still forms of two of their companions bearing eloquent witness to the slenderness of provocation necessary to tighten the trigger figures of the beasts standing guard over them billy byrne never hesitated in his rush for the upper deck the sight of the man awaiting him above but whetted his appetite for battle the trim flannels the white shoes the natty cap were to the mucker as sufficient cause for justifiable homicide as is an orange ribbon in certain portions of the west side of chicago on st patrick's day as were remember the alamo and remember the main to the fighting men of the days that they were live things so were the habiliments of gentility to billy byrne at all times billy mallory was an older man than the mucker twenty-four perhaps and fully as large for four years he had played right guard on the great eastern team and for three he had pulled stroke upon the crew during the two years since his graduation he had prided himself upon the maintenance of the physical supremacy that had made the name of mallory famous in collegiate athletics but in one vital essential he was hopelessly handicapped in combat with such as billy byrne for mallory was a gentleman as the mucker rushed upward toward him mallory had all the advantage of position and preparedness and had he done what billy byrne would have done under like circumstances he would have planted a kick in the midst of the mucker's facial beauties with all the power and weight and energy at his command but billy mallory could no more have perpetuated a cowardly trick such as this than he could have struck a woman instead he waited and as the mucker came to an even footing with him mallory swung a vicious right for the man's jaw byrne ducked beneath the blow came up inside mallory's guard and struck him three times with trip hammer velocity and pile driver effectiveness once upon the draw and twice below the belt the girl clinging to the rail riveted by the paralysis of fright saw her champion stagger back and half crumple to the deck then she saw him make a brave and desperate rally as though torn with agony he lurched forward in an endeavor to clinch with the brute before him again the mucker struck his victim quick choppy hooks that rocked mallory's head from side to side and again the brutal blow below the belt but with the tenacity of a bulldog the man fought for a hold upon his foe and at last notwithstanding byrne's best efforts he succeeded in closing with the mucker and dragging him to the deck here the two men rolled and tumbled byrne biting gouging and kicking while mallory devoted all of his fast waning strength to an effort to close his fingers upon the throat of his antagonist but the terrible punishment which the mucker had inflicted upon him overcame him at last and as byrne felt the man's efforts weakening he partially disengaged himself and raising himself upon one arm dealt his now almost unconscious enemy a half dozen frightful blows upon the face with a shriek barbara harding turned from the awful sight as billy mallory's bloody and swollen eyes rolled up and set while the mucker threw the inert form roughly from him quick to the girl's memory sprang mallory's recent declaration which she had thought at the time but the empty and vainglorious boasting of the man in love why i died for you barbara and welcome the chance poor boy how soon and how terribly has the chance come moaned the girl then a rough hand fell upon her arm here youse a coarse voice yelled in her ear come out o de trance and at the same time she was jerked roughly towards the companionway instinctively the girl held back and then the mucker true to his training true to himself gave her arm a sudden twist that wrenched a scream of agony from her white lips den come along growled billy byrne and quit this monkey business or i'm sure twist your flipper clean off of you with an oath anthony harding sprang forward to protect his daughter but the butt of ward's pistol brought him unconscious to the deck go easy there byrne shouted skipper simms there ain't no call to injure the hussy or corpse won't be worth nothing to us in mute terror the girl now permitted herself to be led to the deck below quickly she was lowered into a waiting boat then skipper simms ordered ward to search the yacht and remove all firearms after which he was to engage himself to navigate the vessel with her whole crew under armed guard of half a dozen of the half moon's cutthroats these things attended to skipper simms with the balance of his own crew and six of the crew of the lotus to take the places upon the brigadine of those he left as a prize crew aboard the yacht returned with the girl to the half moon the sailing vessel's sails were soon hoisted and trimmed and in half an hour followed by the lotus she was scudding briskly southward for forty-eight hours this course was held until simms felt assured that they were well out of the lane of regular trans-pacific traffic during this time barbara harding had been kept below 
locked in a small, untidy cabin. She had seen no one other than the great negro who brought her meals to her three times daily, meals that she returned scarcely touched. Now the half-moon was brought up to the wind, where she lay with flapping canvas, while Skipper Sims returned to the Lotus with the six men of the yacht's crew that he had brought aboard the brigantine with him two days before, and as many more of his own men. Once aboard the Lotus the men were put to work with those already on the yacht. The board's rudder was unshipped and dropped into the ocean. Her fires were put out, her engines were attacked with sledges until they were little better than so much junk, and to make the slender chance of pursuit that remained to her entirely nil, every ounce of coal upon her was shoveled into the Pacific. Her extra masts and spare sails followed the way of the coal in the rudder, so that when Skipper Sims and First Officer Ward left her with her own men that had been aboard her, she was little better than a drifting derelict. From her cabin window Barbara Harding had witnessed the wanton wreckage of her father's yacht, and when it was over, and the crew of the brigantine had returned to their own ship, she presently felt the movement of the vessel as it got under way, and soon the lotus dropped to the stern and beyond the range of her tiny port. With a moan of hopelessness and terror, the girl sank prostrate across the hard berth that spanned one end of her prison cell. How long she lay there she did not know, but finally she was aroused by the opening of her cabin door. As she sprang to her feet, ready to defend herself against what she felt might easily be some new form of danger, her eyes went wide in astonishment as they rested on the face of the man who stood framing the doorway of her cabin. You! she cried. End of chapter 4《"'I am a prisoner,' replied the man, "'just as you are. "'I think they intend holding us for ransom. "'They got me in San Francisco, "'slugged me and hustled me aboard the night before they sailed. "'Where are they going to take us?' she asked. "'I do not know,' he replied, "'although from something I have overheard of their conversations, "'I imagine that they have in mind some distant island "'far from the beaten track of commerce. "'There are thousands such in the Pacific "'that are visited by vessels scarce once in a century.' There they will hold us until they can proceed with the ship to some point where they can get into communication with their agents in the States. When the ransom is paid over to these agents, they will return for us and land us upon some other island where our friends can find us, or leaving us where we can divulge the location of our whereabouts to those who pay the ransom. The girl had been looking intently at Mr. Devine during their conversation. They cannot have treated you very badly, Larry. You are as well-groomed and well-fed, apparently, as ever. A slight flush mounting to the man's face made the girl wonder a bit, though it aroused no suspicion in her mind. Oh, no, he hastened to assure her. They have not treated me at all badly. Why should they? If I die, they can collect no ransom on me. It is the same with you, Barbara, so I think you need apprehend no harsh treatment. I hope you are right, Larry, she said, but the hopelessness of her air rather belied any belief that aught but harm could come from captivity with such as those who officered and manned the half-moon. It seems so remarkable, she went on, that you should be a prisoner upon the same boat. I cannot understand it. Why, only a few days ago we received and entertained a friend of yours who brought a letter from you to Papa, the Count de Cadenet. Again that tell-tale flush mantled the man's cheeks. He cursed himself inwardly for his lack of self-control. The girl would have his whole secret out of him in another half-hour if he were not more careful. They made me do that, he said, jerking his thumb in the direction of Skipper Sim's cabin. Maybe that accounts for their bringing me along. The Count de Cadenet is a fellow named Terrier, second mate of this ship. They sent him to learn your plans, when you expected sailing from Honolulu, and your course. They are all crooks and villains. If I had done as they bid, they would have killed me. The girl made no comment, but Divine saw the contempt in her face. I didn't know they were going to do this. If I had, I'd have died before I'd have written that note, he added rather lamely. The girl was suddenly looking very sad. She was thinking of Billy Mallory, who had died in an effort to save her. The mental comparison she was making between him and Mr. Devine was not overly flattering to the latter gentleman. They killed poor Billy, she said at last. He tried to protect me. 
Then Mr. Devine understood the trend of her thoughts. He tried to find some excuse for his cowardly act, but with the realization of the true cowardliness and treachery of it that the girl didn't even guess, he understood the futility of seeking to extenuate it. He saw that the chances were excellent, that after all he would be compelled to resort to force or threats to win her hand at last. Billy would have done better to have bowed to the inevitable, as I did, he said. Living, I am able to help you now. Dead, I cannot have prevented them carrying out their intentions any more than Billy has, nor can I have been here to aid you now any more than he is. I cannot see that his action helped you to any great extent, brave as it was. The memory of it and him will always help me, she answered quietly. They will help me bear whatever is before me bravely, and, when the time comes, to die bravely, for I should always feel that upon the other side a true, brave heart is awaiting me. The man was silent. After a moment the girl spoke again. I think I would rather be alone, Larry, she said. I am very unhappy and nervous. Possibly I could sleep now. With a bow he turned and left the cabin. For weeks the half-moon kept steadily on her course, a little south of west. There was no material change in the relations of those aboard her. Barbara Harding, finding herself unmolested, finally acceded to the repeated pleas of Mr. Devine, to whose society she had been driven by loneliness and fear, and appeared on deck frequently during the daylight watches. Here, one afternoon, she came face to face with Terrier for the first time since her abduction. The officer lifted his cap deferentially but the girl met his look of expectant recognition with a cold, blank stare that passed through and beyond him as though he had been empty air. A tinge of color rose to the man's face, and he continued on his way for a moment as though content to accept her rebuff, but after a step or two he turned suddenly and confronted her. "'Miss Harding,' he said respectfully, "'I cannot blame you for the feeling of loathing and distrust you must harbor toward me, but in common justice I think you should hear me before finally condemning.' I cannot imagine, she returned coldly, what defense there can be for the cowardly act you perpetrated. I have been utterly deceived by my employers, said Terrier, hastening to take advantage of the tacit permission to explain which her reply contained. I was given to understand that the whole thing was to be but a hoax, that I was taking part in a great practical joke that Mr. Devine was to play upon his old friends, the Hardings, and their guests. Until they wrecked and deserted the Lotus in mid-ocean, I had no idea that anything else was contemplated, although I felt that the matter, even before that event, had been carried quite far enough for a joke. They explained, he continued, that before sailing you had expressed the hope that something really exciting and adventurous would befall the party, that you were tired of the monotonous humdrum of twentieth-century existence, that you regretted the decadence of piracy and the expunging of romance from the sea. Mr. Devine, they told me, was a very wealthy young man to whom you were engaged to be married, and that he could easily afford the great expense of a rather remarkable hoax we were supposed to be perpetrating. I saw no harm in taking part in it, especially as I knew nothing of the supposititious purpose of the cruise until just before we reached Honolulu. Before that, I had been led to believe that it was but a pleasure trip to the South Pacific that Mr. Devine intended. You see, Miss Harding, that I have been as badly deceived as you. Won't you let me help to atone for my error by being your friend? I can assure you that you will need one whom you can trust among this shipload of scoundrels. Who am I to believe? cried the girl. Mr. Devine assures me that he, too, has been forced into this affair, and by threats of death rather than deception. The expression on Mr. Terrier's face was eloquent of sarcastic incredulity. How about the note of introduction that I carried to your father from Mr. Devine? asked Terrier. He says that he was compelled to write it at the point of a revolver, replied the girl. Come with me, Miss Harding, said the officer. I think I may be able to convince you that Mr. Devine is not on any such bad terms with Skipper Sims as would be the case were his story to you true. As he spoke, he started towards the companionway leading to the officer's cabins. Barbara Harding hesitated at the top of the stairway. Have no fear, Miss Harding, Terrier reassured her. Remember that I am your friend, and that I am merely attempting to prove it to your entire satisfaction. You owe it to yourself to discover as soon as possible who your friends are aboard the ship, and who your enemies. Very well, said the girl. I could be in no more danger one place aboard her than another. Terrier led her directly to his own cabin, cautioning her to silence with upraised forefinger. Softly, like skulking criminals, they entered the little compartment. Then Terrier turned and closed the door slipping the bolt noiselessly as he did so. Barbara watched him, her heart beating rapidly with fear and suspicion. 
here whispered Carrier, motioning her towards his berth i have found it advantageous to know what goes on beyond this partition you will find a small round hole near the head of the berth about a foot above the bedding put your ear to it and listen i think divine is in there now the girl still frightened and fearful of the man's intentions did nevertheless as he bid at first she could make out nothing beyond the partition but a confused murmur of voices and the clink of a glass and of the touch of the neck of a bottle against the goblet for a moment she remained in tense silence her ear pressed to the tiny aperture then distinctly she heard the voice of skipper simms i'm a tellin you mate he was saying that there wasn't nothin else to be done and i'm a gettin damn sick of hearin you findin fault all the time with the way i've been a runnin this little job i'm not finding fault simms returned another voice which the girl recognized immediately as divine's although i do think that it was a mistake to so totally disable the lotus as you did why how on earth are we ever to return to civilization if that boat is lost had she been simply damaged a little in a way that they could themselves have fixed up the delay would have been sufficient to permit us to escape and then when miss harding was returned in safety to her father after our marriage they would have been so glad to be reunited that he easily could have been persuaded to drop the matter then another thing you intended to demand a ransom for both miss harding and myself to carry out the fiction of my having been stolen also how can you do that if mr harding be dead and do you suppose for a moment that miss harding will leave a single stone unturned to bring the guilty to justice if any harm has befallen her father or his guests if so you do not know her as well as i the girl turned away from the partition her face white and drawn her eyes inexpressibly sad she rose to her feet facing terrier i have heard quite enough thank you mr terrier she said you are convinced then that i am your friend he asked i am convinced that mr divine is not she replied noncommittally she took a step toward the door terrier stood looking at her she was unquestionably very good to look at he could not remember ever having seen a more beautiful girl a great desire to seize her in his arms swept over the man terrier had not often made any effort to harness his desires what he wanted it had been his custom to take by force if necessary he took a step towards barbara harding there was a sudden light in his eyes that the girl had not before seen there and she reached quickly towards the knob of the door terrier was upon her and then quickly he mastered himself for he recalled his coolly thought out plan based on what divine had told him of that clause in the will of the girl's departed grandparent which stipulated that the man who shared the bequest with her must be the choice of both herself and her father he could afford to bide his time and play the chivalrous protector before he essayed the role of lover barbara turned a half frightened look toward him as he advanced in doubt as to his intentions pardon me miss harding he said the door is bolted let me unlatch it for you and very gallantly he did so swinging the portal wide that she might pass out i feared interruption he said in explanation of the bolt in silence they returned to the upper deck the intoxication of sudden passion now under control terrier was again master of himself and ready to play the cold calculating waiting game that he had determined upon part of his plan was to see just enough of miss harding to ensure a place in her mind at all times but not enough to suggest that he was forcing himself upon her rightly he assumed that she would appreciate thoughtful deference to her comfort and safety under the harrowing conditions of her present existence more than a forced companionship that might entail too open devotion on his part and so he raised his cap and left her only urging her to call upon him at any time that he might be of service to her left alone the girl became lost in unhappy reflections and in the harrowing ordeal of attempting to readjust herself to the knowledge that larry divine her lifelong friend was the instigator of the atrocious villainy that had been perpetrated against her and her father she found it almost equally difficult to believe that mr terrier was so much more sinned against than sinning as he would have had her believe and yet did his story not sound more plausible than that of divine which she had accepted before terrier had made it possible for her to know the truth why then was it so difficult for her to believe the frenchman she could not say but in the inmost recesses of her heart she knew that she mistrusted and feared the man as she stood leaning against the railing buried deep in thought billy byrne passed close behind her at sight of her a sneer curled his lip how he hated her not that she ever had done aught to harm him but rather because she represented to him in concrete form all that he had learned to hate and loathe since early childhood her soft white skin her shapely hands and well-cared-for nails her trim figure and perfectly fitting suit 
all taunted him with that superiority over him and his kind he knew that she looked down upon him as an inferior being she was of the class that addressed those in his walk of life as my man lord how he hated that appellation the intentness of his gaze upon her back had the effect so often noted by the observant and suddenly aroused from the lethargy of her misery the girl swung around to meet the man's eyes squarely upon her instantly she recognized him as the brute who had killed billy mallory if there had been hate in the mucker's eyes as he looked at the girl it was as nothing by comparison with the loathing and disgust which sprang to hers as they rested upon her sullen face so deep was her feeling of contempt for this man that the sudden appearance of him before her startled a single exclamation from her coward came the one word involuntarily from her lips the man scowled deep and menacingly he took a threatening step towards her what's that he growled don't get gay with me or i'll black them lamps for you and he raised a heavy fist as though to strike her the mucker had looked to see the girl cower before his threatening blow that would have been ample atonement for an insult and would have appealed greatly to his kelly gang sense of humor many a time had he threatened women thus for the keen enjoyment of hearing their screams of fright and seeing them turn to flee in terror when they had held their ground and opposed him as some upon the west side had felt sufficiently muscular to do the mucker did not hesitate to hand them one thus only might a man uphold his reputation for bravery in the vicinage of grand avenue he had looked to see this girl of effect and effeminate upper class swoon with terror before him but to his intense astonishment she but stood erect and brave before him her head high held her eyes cold and level and unafraid and then she spoke again coward she said billy almost struck her but something held his hand what he could not understand could it be that he feared this slender girl and at this juncture when the threat of his attitude was the most apparent second officer terrier came upon the scene at a glance he took in the situation and with a bound had sprung between billy byrne and barbara harding end of chapter five Chapter Six of *The Mucker* by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. *The Mucker at Bay*. What has this man said to you, Miss Harding? Cried Terrier. Had he offered you harm? I do not think he would have dared strike me. Replied the girl, though he threatened to do so. He is the coward who murdered poor Mister Mallory upon the Lotus. He might stoop to anything after that. Terrier turned angrily upon Byrne. "'Go below,' he shouted. "'I'll attend to you later. "'If Miss Harding were not here, "'I'd thrash you within an inch of your life now, "'and if I ever hear of your speaking to her again, "'or offering her the slightest indignity, "'I'll put a bullet through you so quick "'you won't know what has struck you.' "'To hell you will,' sneered Billy Byrne. "'I got your number, you big stiff, "'and you better not get gay with me. "'They ain't no guy on board this man's ship.' that can hand billy byrne that kind of scuff and get away with it see and before terrier knew what had happened a heavy fist had caught him upon the point of the chin and lifted him clear off the deck to drop him unconscious at miss harding's feet you see what happens to guys that get gay with me said the mucker to the girl and then stooping over the prostrate form of the mate billy byrne withdrew a huge revolver from terrier's hip pocket i guess i'll need this get my business purty soon he remarked then he planted a vicious kick in the face of the unconscious man and went his way to the forecastle. Now maybe she'll think Billy Burns a coward, he thought, as he disappeared below. Barbara Harding stood speechless with shock at the brutality and ferocity of the unexpected attack upon Terrier. Never in all her life had she dreamed that there could exist upon the face of the earth a thing in human form so devoid of honor and chivalry and fair play as the creature that she had just witnessed threatened a defenseless woman and kicking an unconscious man in the face but then barbara harding had never lived between grand avenue and lake street and halstead and roby where standards of masculine bravery are strange and fearful when she recovered her equanimity she hastened to the head of the cabin companionway and called aloud for help instantly skipper simms and first officer ward rushed on deck each carrying a revolver in readiness for the conflict with their crew that these two worthies were always expecting barbara pointed out the still form of terrier quickly explaining what had occurred it was the fellow byrne who did it she said he has gone into the forecastle now and he has a revolver that he took from mr terrier after he had fallen several of the crew had now congregated upon the prostrate officer here you cried skipper simms to a couple of them 
You take Mr. Theriere below to his cabin and throw cold water in his face. Mr. Ward, get some brandy from my locker and try and bring him to. The rest of you arm yourself with crowbars and axes and see that that son of a sea cook don't get on a deck alive. Hold him there till I get a couple of guns. Then we'll get him, damn him. Skipper Sims hastened below while two of the men were carrying Terrier to his cabin, and Mr. Ward was fetching the brandy. A moment later, Barbara Harding saw the skipper return to the upper deck with a rifle and two revolvers. The sailors whom he had detailed to keep burned below were gathered about the hatchway leading to the forecastle. Some of them were exchanging profane and pleasant badinage with the prisoner. "'You'd better come up and get killed easy-like,' one called down to the mucker. We're apt to must ye all up down there in the dark with these here axes and crowbars, and then when we send ye home, ye poor ma won't know her little boy at all. Yeah, come on down here and try mussing me up, yelled back Billy Byrne. I can lift the whole gang with one hand tied behind me, see? The skipper gorn to get his barkers, Billy, cried Bony Sawyer. Ye better come up and stand trial if it gives ye the chance. Stand nothing, sneered Billy. Swell chance that I have with him on a squint eye holding court over me. Not in your life, Bony. I'm here and here I stays till I croaks, but ye better believe me. I'm going to croak a few before I goes. So if any of you ginks are me friends, ye better keep out of here, so ye won't be getting hurt. And another thing, I'm going to do afore it cashes in. I'm going to put a few of dem ginks into cabin wise to where they stands with one another. If I don't start something before I goes out, me name's not Billy Byrne. At this juncture Skipper Sims appeared with the three weapons he had gone to his cabin to fetch. He handed one to Bony Sawyer, another to Red Sanders, and a third to a man by the name of Wisson. Now, my men, said Skipper Sims, we will go below and bring Byrne up. Bring him alive if you can, but bring him. No one made a move to enter the forecastle. Go on now, move quickly, commanded Skipper Sims, sharply. Thought he said we, remarked one of the sailors. Skipper Sims, livid with rage, turned to search out the offender from the several men behind him. Who was that, he roared. Show me the blithering swab. Just show him to me. I'll tell you, and I'll learn him. Now you, he yelled at the top of his voice, turning again to the men who he had ordered into the forecastle after Billy Byrne. You cowardly landlubbers, you. Get below there quick before I kick you below. Still no one moved to obey him. From white he went to red, and then back to white again. He fairly frothed at the mouth, and he jumped up and down, cursing the men and threatening. But all to no avail. They would not go. Why, Skipper, spoke up Bony Sawyer, it's sure death for any man as goes below there. It's easier and safer to starve him out. Starve nothing, shrieked Skipper Sims. Do you reckon I'm a-going to sit quiet here for a week and let any blanked wharf rat own that there forecastle just because I got a lot of white-livered cowards aboard? No, sir, you're going down after that would-be bad man and fetch him up dead or alive. And with that he started menacingly toward the three who stood near the hatch, holding their firearms safely out of range of Billy Byrne below. What would have happened had Skipper Sims completed the threatening maneuver he had undertaken can never be known, for at this moment Terrier pushed his way through the circle of men who were interested spectators of the impending tragedy. "'What's up, sir?' he asked Sims. "'Anything that I can help you with?' "'Oh!' exclaimed the skipper. So you ain't dead after all, eh? Well, that don't change the look of things a mite. We gotta get that man out of there, and these flea-bitten imitations of men ain't got the guts to go in after him. He's got your gun, sir, spoke up Wisson, and God knows he be the one as only be too glad for a chance to use it. Let me see if I can't handle him, sir, said Terrier to Skipper Sims. We don't want to lose any men if we can help it. The skipper was only too glad to welcome this unexpected rescue from the predicament in which he had placed himself. How Terrier was to accomplish the subjugation of the mutinous sailor he could not guess, nor did he care so long as it was done without risk to his own skin. Now if you'll go away, sir, said Terrier, and order the men away, I'll see what I can do. Skipper Sims did as Terrier had requested, so that presently the officer stood alone beside the hatch. Across the deck, amidships, the men had congregated to watch Terrier's operations, while beyond them stood Barbara Harding held fascinated by the grim tragedy that was unfolding before her upon this accursed vessel. Terrier leaned over the open hatch in full view of the waiting burn, ready below. There was the instant report of a firearm, and a bullet whizzed close past Terrier's head. Avast there, burn, he shouted. It's I, Terrier. Don't shoot again. I want to speak to you. No monkey business now, growled the mucker in reply. I won't miss again. I want to talk to you, burn, said Terrier in a low tone. I'm coming down there. 
no you ain't cull returned byrne leastways you ain't a-comin down here alive yes i am byrne replied terrier and you don't want to be foolish about it i'm unarmed you can cover me with your gun until you have satisfied yourself as to that i'm the only man on the ship that can save your life the only man that has any reason to want to but we've got to talk it over and we can't talk this way where there is a chance of being overheard i'll be on the square with you if you will with me and if we can't come to terms i'll come above again and you won't be any worse off than you are now here i come and without waiting for an acceptance of his proposition the second officer of the half moon slipped over the edge of the hatchway and disappeared from the sight of the watchers above that he was a brave man even billy byrne had to admit and those above who knew nothing of the relations existing between the second mate and the sailor who had so recently felled him thought that his courage was little short of marvelous Terrier's stock went up by leaps and bounds in the estimation of the sailors of the half moon for degraded though they were they could understand and appreciate physical courage of this sort while to barbara harding the man's act seemed unparalleled in its utter disregard of the consequences of life and death to himself that it entailed she suddenly was sorry that she had entertained any suspicions against Terrier. so brave a man could not be other than the soul of honor she argued once below terrier found himself covered by his own revolver in the hands of the very desperate and very unprincipled man he smiled at byrne as the latter eyed him suspiciously see you there byrne said terrier it would be foolish for me to say that i am doing this for love of you the fact is that i need you we cannot succeed either of us alone i think you made a fool play when you hit me today and you know that our understanding was that i was to be even a little rougher with you than usual in order to avoid suspicion being attached to any seemingly familiarity between us should we be caught conferring together i had the chance to ball you out today and i thought that you would understand that i was but taking advantage of the opportunity which it afforded to make it plain to miss harding that there could be nothing other than hatred between us it might have come in pretty handy later to have her believe that if i had any idea that you really intended hitting me you'd have been a dead man before your fist reached me byrne you took me entirely by surprise but that's all in the past i'm willing to let bygones be bygone and help you out of the pretty pickle you've gotten yourself into then we can go ahead with our work as though nothing had happened what do you say i didn't know you were kiddin replied the mucker or i wouldn't have hit you you acted like you meant it very well that part's understood said terrier now will you come out if i can square the thing with the skipper so as you won't get more than a day or so in irons he'll have to give you something to save his own face but i promise that you'll get your food regularly and that you won't be beaten up the way you were before when we had you below if you won't agree to what i propose i give you my word to tell you so go ahead said billy byrne i don't trust nobody when i don't have to but i'll be dinged if i see any other way out of it terrier returned to the deck and seeking out the skipper drew him to one side i can get him up peaceably if i can assure him that he'll only get a day or so in the cooler with full rations and no beatings i think sir that this will be the easiest way out of it we cannot spare a man now if we want to get the fellow later we can always find some pretext very well mr terrier replied the skipper i'll leave the matter entirely in your hands you can do what you want with the fellow it's you as had your face pun terrier returned immediately to the forecastle from which he presently emerged with the erstwhile recalcitrant burn and for two days the latter languished in endurance vile and that was the end of the episode though its effects were manifold for one thing it implanted in the heart of terrier a personal hatred for the mucker so that while heretofore his intention of ridding himself of the man when he no longer needed him was due purely to a matter of policy it was now reinforced by a keen desire for personal revenge the occurrence had also had its influence upon barbara harding in that it had shown her mr terrier in a new light one that reflected credit upon him she had thought his magnanimous treatment of the sailor little short of heroic and it had deepened the girl's horror of billy byrne until it now amounted to little short of an obsession so vivid an impression had his brutality made upon her that she would start from deep slumber dreaming that she was menaced by him after billy was released for duty following his imprisonment he several times passed the girl upon deck he noticed that she shrank from him in disgust and terror but what surprised him was that instead of the thrill of pride which he formerly would have felt at this acknowledgment of his toughness for billy prided himself on being a tough he now felt a singular resentment against the girl for her attitude so that he came to hate her even more than he had before hated formerly he had hated her for the things she stood for now he hated her for herself terrier was often with her now and less frequently divine for at the second officer's suggestion barbara had not acquainted that gentleman with the fact that she was aware of his duplicity it is as just as well not to let him know said terrier 
it gives you an advantage that would be wanting should he suspect the truth so that now you are always in a position to be warned in plenty of time against any ulterior suggestion he may make keep me posted as to all he tells you of his plans and in this way we can defeat him much more easily than as though you followed your natural inclinations and refused to hold communication of any sort with him it might be well miss harding even to encourage him in the hope that you will wed him voluntarily i think that will throw him entirely off his guard and pave the way for your early release oh i doubt if i can do that mr terrier exclaimed the girl you cannot imagine how i loathe the man now that i know him in his true colors for years he has importuned me to marry him and though i never cared for him in that way at all and never could i felt that he was a very good friend and that his constancy demanded some return on my part my friendship and sympathy at least but now i shiver whenever he is near me just as i would were i to find a snake coiled close beside me i cannot abide treachery nor i miss harding agreed terrier glibly the man deserves nothing but your contempt though for policy's sake i hope that you will find it possible to lead him on until his very treachery proves the means of your salvation for believe me if he has been false to you how much more quickly will he be false to sims and ward he would ditch them in a minute if the opportunity presented itself for him to win you without their aid i had thought it might be feasible to lead him into attempting to take the ship by force and return you to san francisco or better still possibly to the nearest civilized port you might with propriety suggest this to him telling him that you believe that i would stand ready to assist in the undertaking i can promise you the support of several of the men quite a sufficient number with divine and myself easily to take the half moon away from our present officers i will think over your suggestion mr terrier replied barbara and i thank you for the generous impulse that has prompted you to befriend me heaven knows how badly i need a friend now amongst so many enemies what is it mr terrier what is the matter the officer had turned his eyes casually towards the southeast as the girl spoke and just now he had given a sudden exclamation of surprise and alarm that cloud miss harding he answered we're in for a bad blow and it'll be on us in a minute and with that he started forward on a run calling back over his shoulders you'd better get below at once End of chapter six chapter seven of the mucker by edgar rice burroughs this librivox recording is in the public domain Recorded by Joe Denoya, Somerset, New Jersey. The Typhoon The storm that struck the half-moon took her entirely unaware. It had sprung, apparently, out of a perfectly clear sky. Both the lookout and the man at the wheel were ready to take oath that they had scanned the horizon not a half a minute before the second mate Terrier had come racing forward, bellowing for all hands on deck and ordering a sailor below to report the menacing conditions to Captain Sims. Before that officer reached the deck, Terrier had the entire crew aloft taking in sail. But though they worked with the desperation of doomed men, they were only partially successful in their efforts. The sky and sea had assumed a sickly yellowish color, except for the mighty black cloud that raced towards them low over the water. The low moaning sound that had followed the first appearance of the storm gave place to a sullen roar, and then, of a sudden, the thing struck the half-moon, ripping her remaining canvas from her as if it had been wrought from tissue paper and with the flying canvas spars and cordage went the mainmast snapping ten feet above the deck and crashing over the starboard bow with a noise and jar that rose above the bellowing of the typhoon fully half the crew of the half moon either went down with the falling rigging or were crushed by the crashing weight of the mast as it hurtled against the deck skipper sims rushed back and forth screaming out curses that no one heeded and orders that there was none to fill Terrier, on his own responsibility, looked to the hatches. Ward, with a handful of men armed with axes, attempted to chop away the wreckage, for the jagged butt of the fallen mass was dashing against the ship's side with such vicious blows that it seemed but a matter of seconds ere it would stave a hole in her. With the utmost difficulty a sea anchor was rigged and tumbled over the half moon's pitching bow into the angry sea that was rising to a more gigantic proportion with each succeeding minute this frail makeshift which at best could but keep the vessel's bow into the wind saving her from the instant engulfment in the sea's trough seemed to terrier but a sorry means of prolonging the agony of suspense preceding the inevitable end that nothing could save them was the second officer's firm belief nor was he alone in his conviction not only sims and ward but every experienced sailor on the ship felt that the life of the half moon was now but a matter of hours possibly minutes while those of the lesser experience were equally positive 
that each succeeding wave must mark the termination of the lives of the vessel and her company the deck washed now almost continually by hurtling tons of storm-mad water as one mountainous wave followed another the length of the ship had become entirely impossible with difficulty the men were attempting to get below between waves all semblance of discipline had vanished for the most part they were a pack of howling cursing terror-ridden beasts fighting at the hatches with those who would have held them closed against the danger of each new assault of the sea ward and skipper simms had been among the first to seek the precarious safety below deck terrier alone of the officers had remained on duty until the last and now he was exerting his every faculty in the effort to save as many of the men as possible without losing the ship in the doing of it only between waves was the entrance to the main cabins negotiable while the forecastle hatch had been abandoned entirely after it had with difficulty been replaced following the retreat of three of the crew to that part of the ship the mucker stood beside terrier as the latter beat back the men when the sea threatened it was the man's first experience of the kind never had he faced death in the courage blighting form which the grim harvester assumes when he calls unbridled nature to do his ghastly bidding the mucker saw the rough brawling bullies of the forecastle reduced to white-faced gibbering cowards clawing and fighting to climb over one another toward the lesser danger of the cabins while the mate fought them off except as he found it expedient to let them pass him he alone cool and fearless byrne stood as one apart from the dangers and hysteric strivings of his fellows once when terrier happened to glance in his direction the frenchman mentally ascribed the mucker's seeming lethargy to the paralysis of abject cowardice the fellow is in a blue funk thought the second mate i did not misjudge him like all his kind he is a coward at heart then a great wave came following unexpectedly close upon the heels of a lesser one it took Terrier off his guard, threw him down, and hurled him roughly across the deck, landing him in the scuppers, bleeding and stunned. The next wave would carry him overboard. Released from surveillance, the balance of the crew pushed and fought their way into the cabin. Only the mucker remained without, staring first at the prostrate form of the mate, and then at the open cabin hatch. Had one been watching him, he might reasonably have thought that the man's mind was in the muddle of confused thoughts and fears. But such was far from the case. Billy was waiting to see if the mate would revive sufficiently to return across the deck before the next wave swept the ship. It was very interesting. He wondered what odds O'Leary would have laid against the man. In another moment the wave would come. Billy glanced at the open cabin hatch. That would never do. The cabin would be flooded with tons of water should the next wave find the hatch still open. Billy closed it, and he looked again towards Terrier. The man was just recovering consciousness, and the wave was coming something stirred within billy byrne it gripped him and made him act quickly as though by instinct to do something that no one billy himself least of all would have suspected that the grand avenue mucker would have been capable of across the deck terrier was dragging himself painfully to his hands and knees as though to attempt the impossible feat of crawling back to the cabin hatch the wave was almost upon billy in a moment it would engulf him and then rush on across to tear terrier from the deck and hurl him beyond the ship into the tumbling watery chaos of the sea the mucker saw all this and in the instant he launched himself towards the man for whom he had no use whose kind he hated reaching him as the great wave broke over them crushing them to the deck choking and blinding them for a moment they were buried in the swirling maelstrom and then as the half moon rose again shaking the watery enemy from her back the two men were disclosed terrier half over the ship's side the mucker clinging to him with one hand the other clutching desperately at a huge cleat upon the gunwale byrne dragged a mate to the deck and then slowly and with infinite difficulty across it to the cabin hatch through it he pushed the man tumbling after him and closing the aperture just as another wave swept the half moon terrier was conscious but little the worse for his experience though badly bruised he looked at the mucker in astonishment as the two faced each other in the cabin i don't know why you did it said terrier neither do i replied billy byrne i shall not forget it byrne said the officer you'd better answered billy turning away the mucker was extremely puzzled to account for his act he did not look upon it at all as a piece of heroism but rather as a fool's play which he should be ashamed of the very idea saving the life of a gink who despite his brutal ways belonged to the much despised highbrow class billy was peeved with himself terrier for his part was surprised at the unexpected heroism of the man he had long since rated as a cowardly bully he was fully determined to repay byrne in so far as he could the great debt he owed him 
all thoughts of revenge for the mucker's former assault upon him were dropped and he now looked upon the man as a true friend and ally for three days the half-moon plunged helplessly upon the storm-racked surface of the mad sea no soul aboard her entertained more than the faintest glimmer of a hope that the ship would ride out the storm but during the third night the wind died down and by morning the sea had fallen sufficiently to make it safe for the men of the half-moon to venture upon deck there they found the brigantine clean swept from stem to stern to the north of them was land at a league or two perhaps had the storm continued during the night they would have been dashed upon the coast god-fearing men would have given thanks for their miraculous rescue but not so these instead the fear of death removed they assumed their former bravado skipper simms boasted of the seamanship that had saved the half moon his own seamanship of course ward was cursing the luck that had disabled the ship at so crucial a period of her adventure and revolving in his evil mind various possible schemes for turning the misfortune to his own advantage billy byrne sitting upon the corner of the galley table hobnobbed with blanco these choice representatives of the ship's company were planning a raid on the skipper's brandy chest during that disembarkation which the sight of land had rendered not improbable the half moon with the wind down wallowed heavily in the trough of the sea but even so barbara harding wearied with days of confinement in her stuffy cabin below ventured above deck for a breath of sweet clean air scarce had she emerged from below than terrier espied her and hastened to her side well miss harding he exclaimed it seems good to see you on deck again i can't tell you how sorry i have felt for you cooped up alone in your cabin without a single woman for companionship and all those frightful days of danger for there was scarce one of us that thought the old hooker would weather so long and hard of low we were mighty fortunate to come through it handily handily queried barbara harding with a wry smile glancing about the deck of the half moon i cannot see that we are either through it handily or through it at all we have no masts no canvas no boats and though i am not much of a sailor i can see that there is little likelihood of our effecting a landing on the shore ahead either with or without boats it looks most forbidding then the wind has gone down and when it comes up again it is possible that it will carry us away from the land or if it takes us toward it dash us to pieces at the foot of those frightful cliffs i see you are too good a sailor by far to be cheered by any questionable hopes laughed terrier but you must take the will into consideration i only wish to give you a ray of hope that might lighten your burden of apprehension however honestly i do think that we may find a way to make a safe landing if the sea continues to go down as it has the past two hours we are not more than a league from shore and with the jury mast and sail that the men are setting under mr ward now we can work in comparative safely with a light breeze which we should have during the afternoon there are few coasts however rugged they may appear at a distance that do not offer some foothold for the wrecked mariner and i doubt not but that we shall find this no exception to the rule i hope you are right mr terrier said the girl and yet i cannot but feel that my position will be less safe on land than it had been upon the half moon once free from the restraints of discipline which tradition custom and law enforce upon the high seas there is no telling what atrocities these men will commit to be quite candid mr terrier i dread a landing worse than i dreaded the danger of the storm through which we have just passed i think you have little to fear on that score miss harding said the frenchman i intend making it quite plain that i consider myself your protector once we have left the half moon and i can count on several of the men to support me even mr divine will not dare do otherwise then we can set up a camp of our own apart from skipper simms and his faction where you will be constantly guarded until succor may be obtained barbara harding had been watching the man's face as he spoke the memory of his consideration and respectful treatment of her during the trying weeks of her captivity had done much to erase the intuitive feeling of distrust that had tinged her thoughts of him earlier in their acquaintance while his heroic act in descending into the forecastle in the face of the armed and desperate burn had thrown a glamour of romance about him that could not help but tend to fascinate a girl of barbara harding's type then there was the look that she had seen in his eyes for a brief instant when she had found herself locked in his cabin on the occasion that he had revealed to her larry divine's duplicity that expression no red-blooded girl could mistake and the fact that he had subdued his passion spoke eloquently to the girl of the fineness and chivalry of his nature so now it was with a feeling of utter trustfulness that she gladly gave herself into the keeping of henry terrier count de cadmay second officer of the half moon oh mr terrier she cried if you can only but arrange it so how relieved and almost happy i shall be how can i ever repay you for all that you have done for me 
Again she saw the light leap into the man's eyes, the light of a love that would not be denied much longer other than through the agency of a mighty will. Love, she thought it, but the eye-light of love and lust are twin lights between which it takes much worldly wisdom to differentiate, and Barbara Harding was not worldly wise in the ways of sin. "'Miss Harding,' said Terrier, in a voice that he evidently found it difficult to control, "'do not ask me now how you may repay me. I—' But what he would have said he checked, and with an effort of will that was almost appreciable to the eye he took a fresh grip upon himself, and continued, "'I am aptly repaid by being able to serve you, and thus to retrieve myself in your estimation. I know that you have doubted me, that you have questioned the integrity of my acts that helped to lead up to the unfortunate affair of the Lotus. When you tell me that you no longer doubt, that you accept me as the friend I wish to be, I shall be more than amply repaid for anything which it may have been my good fortune to have been able to accomplish for your comfort and safety. Then I may partially repay you at once, exclaimed the girl with a smile, for I can assure you that you possess my friendship to the fullest, and with it, of course, my entire confidence. It is true that I doubted you at first. I doubted everyone connected with the half-moon. Why shouldn't I? But now I think I am able to draw a very clear line between my friends and my enemies. There is but one upon the right side of that line, you, my friend. And with an impulsive little gesture, Barbara Harding extended her hand to Terrier. It was with almost a sheepish expression that the Frenchman took the proffered fingers, for there had been in that frank avowal of confidence and friendship which smote upon the cord of honor in the man's soul that had not vibrated in response to a chivalrous impulse for so many long years that it had nearly atrophied from disuse. Then, of a sudden, the second officer of the half-moon straightened to his full height. His head went high, and he took the small hand of the girl in his own strong brown one. "'Miss Harding,' he said, "'I have led a hard, bitter life. I have not always done those things of which I might be most proud. But there have been times when I have remembered that I am the grandson of one of Napoleon's greatest field marshals, and that I bear a name that has been honored by a mighty nation. What you have just said to me recalls these facts most vividly to my mind. I hope, Miss Harding, that you will never regret having spoken them and to the bottom of his heart the man meant what he said at the moment, for inherent chivalry is as difficult to suppress or uproot as is inherent viciousness. The girl let her hand rest in his for a moment, and as their eyes met she saw in his a truth and honesty and cleanness which revealed what Terrier might have been, had fate ordained his young manhood to different channels. And in that moment a question sprang, all unbidden and unforeseen to her mind, a question which caused her to withdraw her hand quickly from his, and which sent a slow crimson to her cheek. Billy Byrne, slouching by, cast a bitter look of hatred upon the two. The fact that he had saved Terrier's life had not increased his love for that gentleman. He was still much puzzled to account for the strange idiocy that had prompted him to that act, and two of his fellows had felt the weight of his mighty fist when they had spoken words of rough praise for his heroism. Billy had thought that they were kidding him. To Billy, the knocking out of Terrier and the subsequent kick which he had planted in the unconscious man's face were true indications of manliness. He gauged such manners by standards purely Grand Avenue-esque, and now it enraged him to see that the girl before, whose very eyes he had demonstrated his superiority over Terrier, should so look with favor upon the officer. It did not occur to Billy that he would care to have the girl look with favor upon him. Such a thought would have sent him into a berserker rage, but the fact remained that Billy felt a strong desire to cut out Terrier's heart when he saw him now in close converse with Barbara Harding. Just why he felt so Billy could not have said. The truth of the matter is that Billy was far from introspective. In fact, he did very little thinking. His mind had never been trained to it, and his muscles had been trained to fighting. Billy reacted more quickly to instinct than to the processes of reasoning, and on this account it was difficult for him to explain any great number of his acts or moods. It is to be doubted, however, that Billy Byrne had ever attempted to get at the bottom of his soul, if he possessed one. Be that as it may, had Terrier known it, he was very near death at that moment when a summons from Skipper Sims called him aft and saved his life. Then the mucker, unseen by the officer, approached the girl. In his heart were rage and hatred, and as the girl turned at the sound of his step behind her, she saw them mirrored in his dark, scowling face. End of chapter 7